This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. We're on the second part today of the Passover, the Lamb of God, and the Scroll of Destiny. For those that are going to be watching it from TV, it's going to be parts three and four. And I want to start today in the book of Acts. We're following the Lamb. Now, I'm not going to deal with everything that happened when Jesus ascended or descended into hell, whooped up on the devil. We deal with that, dealt with that last year during Passover, but I'm headed in a little bit different direction today. You know, people don't argue the existence of Caesar, Julius Caesar, or Confucius, or many other historical figures. But no one has been attacked like Jesus. No one has, uh, has have things been skewed and lied upon and, uh, historically. There's even those that doubt today that he ever existed. And so I want to read... Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, and this is the beginning of the second writing of Luke to Theophilus, which there's still debate among scholars whether there was an actual Theophilus, or that can simply be translated from the Greek, the faithful that believe in God. Starting the farmer treatise, I have made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to both, to both to do and teach, until the day that he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he chose, to whom also he showed himself alive for after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God." There's a lot that we can take a part in this. Number one, if Jesus did away with commandments at the cross, why is he still giving commandments after his resurrection? Whenever God gives instruction, whenever a king gives instruction, it is inherent by its very nature a commandment. There were commandments in the garden before Adam and Eve fell. There was a knowledge of God that still existed within man, but Israel lost when they were in captivity in the wilderness. They had to relearn that through the writings of Moses, but it was, the, the, the Torah is not just about the history and the commandments of God. There is a constitution on how to operate a nation encoded within Torah. There's also the regulations for a priesthood. With, there's, there are a lot of things within Torah besides commandments. But this concept, this, um, oh, there's a lot of words I could call it. I don't want to have to go back and edit the video. But there, there, there is this sinful, carnal nature that wants to attack the commandments of God because as long as the commandments exist, it reveals the carnal nature 
and how man is reprobate and how that he needs a Savior. And so if we can eliminate the commandments, there's no need for Jesus, there's no need for repentance, there's no need for blood sacrifice, and we're going back to what happened in the Garden of Eden when the Nechesh came and said, listen, you eat of this fruit, you now get to decide what's right and wrong, and you'll become as God. How many know that didn't happen? And Adam and Eve may have strutted in the garden thinking, I have arrived until God showed up. And then these empowered people with this new infusion of what the Nechesh promised them went and hid. That shows you how far sin goes when God shows up. So Jesus is giving commandments. He spent 40 days teaching on the kingdom of God before his ascension. Boy, wouldn't you like to have been a fly on the wall to have heard what he taught. And it's a shame that it wasn't officially recorded. No, it was contained in the doctrine of the apostles we see throughout the book of Acts and we see in, in, in the other writings. But boy, would it not, had not have been a blessing to say, listen, these are the things that Jesus taught after the resurrection and have another little gospel or something. There are a lot of times I wish that that would have been, but God in his wisdom chose not to. But then it says this next thing, showed himself alive with many infallible proofs. That word infallible in the Greek is tekmerion, which means that from which something is surely or plainly known, it is to give absolute proof. You see, we need to understand something about what we see going on in the book of Acts. If this whole thing of, of faking Jesus' resurrection by going and stealing the body out of the tomb, how many know that kind of conspiracy would not have lasted very long if those that perpetrated it were beginning to be executed? They would have recanted. Men are only willing to die for truth. Now, what's interesting historically about socialism and communism is the men that teach it are unwilling to die for it. Like Sololinsky said, they're continually looking for useful idiots that are willing to die for the things that those that perpetrate it are unwilling to do. Why? Because they have got to be the new ruler and the new ruler class. It's a doctrine of enslavement. But we see something happen here in the early church. The apostles that were testifying that Jesus rose from the grave, they were willing to go to jail, to be tortured, to be persecuted, and to even give up their lives for the message that he rose victorious over death, hell, and the grave. You see, that's the greatest proof. We cannot go back and show a photo or show a video but their lives speak more powerfully than a photo or a video or recording ever would because in this day and age we know that photos can be photoshopped, that videos can be edited, and that even voice print. They actually have technology now where they can take a sample of your voice and make it say anything, and even voice analysis cannot tell the difference. It's called voice photoshop. And what's interesting is after it came out and they realized what they could do, it was taken off the market and poof, is now, is now owned and used by CIA, NSA, and the deep state. So even hearing a recording saying this is absolute proof that somebody said this, no, it's not anymore. But what somebody's willing to die for is absolute proof of its validity. For 40 days, 40 days Jesus wandered in the wilderness being tempted of the devil. Now after his resurrection, there's a new wandering going on. And he's wandering around showing himself to his disciples, teaching them, loving them, instructing them because he knows that after 40 days, there's going to be an ascension and he wants them prepared. How many know that's a loving God? Okay. Okay. 
We need in this day and this hour, we have got to say Jesus absolutely laid down his life on the cross for us. His blood was shed for our salvation. He died in our place, and then he victoriously conquered death, hell, and the grave, and he rose from the dead. And he is now sitting at the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning. Aren't you glad? I will be glad when his rule and reign is absolute and complete. It's coming. What we see in the book of Revelation is an undoing of the Tower of Babel. Because God divorced, we've already dealt with this, God divorced humanity. Turned them over to principalities and powers and rulers. Yet there is a pivotal statement in the book of Revelation. Now have the nations become his. How many know that there is, there is a day of judgment coming even for principalities and powers and rulers of darkness? Now I want to go to verse 9. Because what we're doing is we're following the Lamb. Now he tells them, go up in Jerusalem because there's an empowerment coming. And it says, and when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. No wings. You know, the, the whole concept of angels needing wings, that's because man couldn't figure out how anything could fly without wings. But when you understand higher special dimensions and a lot of other things, he just decided it's now time to go, and he just rose up. Received in a great cloud of witness. What's all that? All the saints that had resurrected when he resurrected. Abraham's bosom is empty. Sheol is still there. The lower part of Sheol is still there. In fact, the prophet said that because of the rebellion of man, that God had to expand it, make it bigger. It's still full to the brim. The upper part, Abraham's bosom, is empty. Now how did Jesus leave? Everyone saw he ascended. You need to underline that in your Bible because there's going to be angels show up that say something very distinct. So everybody was there saw it. Whether you were a believer in Jesus or a rabbi rebelling and saying that he was not the Messiah. They all saw it. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. How many know that was immortals? That was angels. Which said, which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing in, up into heaven? This same Jesus, underline same, not another. This same Jesus the one with the nail prints in his hands and his feet, the one that his side was pierced, the one who wore the crown of thorns, the same Jesus, which is taken up from you in heaven, shall also, in, shall also come in like manner as you have seen him go up. So as he went up, he's coming back down. Not a secret appearing, There's not going to be people saying, he came back, he's hid it out in the desert somewhere, and if, you, and if you follow us and you give us all your money, we'll take you there, and if you have enough faith, you can see him. The Bible says that when he comes back, even those that pierced him will look on him and weep. When he returns, it's going to be an earth event. Now, Having said that, well, Mike, you, you got friends that teach that there's a secret catching away before he comes back, and so there's there are two coming backs in the book of Revelation. What do you have to say about that? That's their opinion. I got mine. Well, what are you going to do about it? Nothing. They're my friends. If we fought over every single difference of opinion that we had in the Bible, every denomination would be made up of one man. Come on. Let's quit being childish. Now, if I believe in a, in a pre-wrath or 
post-trib return of the Lord and someone believes in a pre-trib of the Lord, can I point at them and call them apostate? Absolutely not. That is a difference of opinion of looking through a glass darkly. Now, if I had you all put on sunglasses, and I turned the lights off in this place, and I held up a sign, and I said, now read to me what's on the sign. Every one of you would come up with something different. Now, does that mean you attack the person who came up with a different thing than you did, looking through a glass darkly with no light? But what is revealed? Jesus is Almighty God come in the flesh. That he was born of a virgin. That he had a perfect life. That he gave his life for us on the cross. And, if it, and without that shed blood and trust in that completed work, you are not saved. And that he rose victorious from death, hell, and the grave. And the word of God is the inerrant, infallible word of God. If you don't believe that, then you are apostate. These little things, let's quit using that huge big hammer to beat people over the head. We are too quick to pull that gun, and God has not called us to be gunslingers in the kingdom of God. He's called us to be proclaimers of truth. And on the minor things, we can disagree. Because the, the argument and the backbiting about when the, when the Lord is going to return is like a bunch of snotty kids arguing when daddy's going to come home instead of being about daddy's what daddy told them to do and have done by the time he gets back. And I tell my friends that are, pre, that are pre-trib, I said, you know what, when it happens and if they are right, I will give you a high five on the way up here and I'll say, I am so glad you were right. But I'm preparing my heart, my mind, and my soul just in case because there are historically different positions. Come on now. You know, it's a whole lot better to be prepared for post and be surprised by pre than to be demanding pre and get surprised by post. We also need to understand now, Jesus was just talking about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And then he's taken up as they watched. They all beheld because the ascension of Elijah was a type and shadow of Jesus ascending, and he said, go wait in Jerusalem just 10 days, just 10 days, okay? The day that he resurrected that morning began first fruits offering. You start counting the Omer for 50 days. He was walking around 40 days. How many days does that leave? I know we're not doing new math, so it's real easy. 10, okay? Ten, go up there, and tarry in Jerusalem for 10 days because in 10 days my mantle of ministry is going to fall. And it is a mantle of ministry to do, to continue the work. The apostles had it right when they said, when they, when they drew lots, I don't know if they necessarily needed to draw lots, although they, they found some scripture for it because the, the, the apostle they picked really kind of goes into obscurity then the apostle Paul picked, you know, jumps up but there are actually, uh, those that have studied in the Greek actually claim there are about 21 apostles listed in the New Testament. But what they had right is that we got to choose someone to take his portion of Jesus' ministry. You see, everything we do is an extension, a continuation of his ministry in the earth. It's his mantle, it's his name. It's his blood that gets it done. It's his spirit that empowers it. We are nothing more than faithful UPS or FedEx men. He sends us, we deliver the package, but all the glory goes to him. Now, and I want to get into the good part. We're going into Revelation chapter 5. Now, I want to set some ground rules and the Holy Spirit's not released me to do a verse by verse yet on the book of Revelation. That may one day be coming. Maybe another one. The book of Revelation, episode number 270. Because there's a lot to compact there. 
But when you read the book of Revelation, now I want to start with some news I heard this morning. Skywatch TV just released, that brought the attention to a recent article that more people are reading the Bible than ever before. Unfortunately, none of them are Christians. Christians are reading it less. So while the, while the Christians are in Laodicea are all captured in the best life now, and they're not reading the Bible. Oh, Joe, the bartender down the road that's a sinner is thinking, you know what, as I look at the world, it looks a whole lot like the book of Revelation. Maybe I ought to start reading the Bible. If they start reading the Bible, they're going to get saved. They're going to get empowered. And one of these days, it's going to be those people who take off and run with the anointing of Jesus and leave what was called the church in the dust. That's just my opinion. But when you look at what's going on with Generation X, whatever the, next, the new generation is, the, the millennial generation and the XYZ generation, now I think the, now they call it generation, I don't know. Because most of them just don't know. They're not going to know who they are until they discover themselves in Christ. And let me tell you something. It's coming. It's going to be the last great revival. But when we look at the book of Revelation, take the writing literally unless the language used is clearly prophetic imagery. Okay? When you start having a woman with, ten, with 12 stars and, and all these different things, how many know that's prophetic imagery? And sometimes there's prophetic speak. That was established by the earlier prophets years ago. There was a seminar, and it was actually held by traditional rabbis. And it was saying the book of Revelation is nothing more than plagiarism. It's, it's just all rehash of what's already in the Old Testament. Maybe because it's the same revelation. It's just revealing it in a deeper sense. Because nobody has, a prog uh, nobody has an argument that Isaiah stole from Nehemiah or Ezra or Ezekiel. If the same God is speaking through the same people, there will be the same prophetic imagery. We also need to know that the first three chapters of the Bible were written, were written to real congregations that existed in the time it was written. At the same time, there is a prophetic unction in those seven letters that also represent both time periods throughout church history and reveal stumbling blocks that every single church faces today. Now, I tell you what, prophetically, the, the prosperity church and the church in the West more resembles Laodicea than I think any other church in history except for maybe the church in Laodicea. We think we have it made, that we're, we're, we're wearing these spiritual Armani suits, and God tells us we're lucky if we're wearing BVDs in His kingdom because we have trusted in affluence instead of the completed work of Christ and the sanctification process of the Holy Spirit in our lives to make us more like Jesus. Now, starting with the fourth chapter, the book tends to be linear in its foretelling of future events. Now, there are, there are those, and most of them tend to be all millennial, that have the position that everything was fulfilled at the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. The problem with that argument is the book of Revelation was written nearly 30 years later. And since it's a prophetic book, what's also essential about it, there, when we look at the Tetragrammaton, the sacred name of God, yod heh vav -Heh, it can literally be translated, the God with the nailed hand shall be revealed twice, because uh, yod heh vav -Heh, heh is an opening door, something being revealed. The Gospels reveal Messiah ben Joseph, the book of Revelation reveals Messiah ben David. So, apocalypse does not mean that the earth is falling apart. It, literally, apocalypse in, in Greek means the revealing, the unveiling. It's the unveiling of Jesus. So, when you read the book of Revelation, you start finding out more about Jesus than is contained in the Gospels. Okay? Now, as I was thinking about when, and what precipitated this whole thing of dealing with this chapter is I'm driving along in my car, minding my own business. 
And, you know, I've been able to hear part of the song and kind of, oh, that was kind of a good song, but I was in the car by myself, and so I crank it up, and there's a song by Chris Tomlin called, Is He Worthy? And it should have been followed up by my song, I'm Almost in a Ditch. Because the anointing of the Holy Spirit hit me, I began crying like a baby, because sometimes there are songs, and I mean, there are many, many wonderful songs, there are great psalmists in the body of Christ, but is this like in a church service? If the songs that you can sing begin matching what's going on in heaven, heaven comes down. And I think there's a prophetic unction right now with that song speaking to this time that we're about to Revelation chapter 5. Now, prophetically speaking, that can mean tomorrow, five years from now, but it's coming, it's quicker than we, it's sooner than we have ever been there before. So much so that the prophetic anointing on that event is beginning to spill over. Everybody agree with that? I mean, that, that song is one song, not the, it's hard not to ball gut halfway through the song. It is hard. Because there's something, there's an expectation in your spirit, man. Man, I want to get there. I, I, boy, let that come, let that come, let that come. Well, I want to take it apart this morning. In the ancient plains of Shinar, an evil was born. The first world king, the prototype transhuman, the ultimate despot, Nimrod. In Babylon, the son of perdition devised the Shinar Directive a plan to enslave humanity and make war against the God of Heaven. God's intervention at the Tower of Babel only delayed Nimrod's hellish plans. As the powers of Mystery Babylon gather to create the new Tower of Babel and to prepare for the Son of Perdition's return, Heaven is issuing a clarion call to the remnant. The Shinar Directive will reveal the strategies of the enemy that will help you untangle yourself from them and become the victorious church. It is time for the remnant to wake up, discern the times, and be infused with heaven's power to withstand The Shinar Directive by Dr. Michael Lake. Get your copy today at kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.